So it wasn't enough for you to create the best operating system in the world. You also had to go and create the best version control system. Damn it, Linus. Damn it. Hello and welcome back to Artful Bytes. Today's video is going to be about version controlling with Git. The goal of this video is to initialize the repository that I will be using throughout this video series, as well as making the first commit, which is going to be to commit the project structure that I showed you in the last video. Today, Git has become the de facto standard when it comes to version controlling software projects. And if you want to become a programmer, you must know Git. And programming embedded systems is no exception. My aim with this video is not for it to be an in-depth tutorial about how to use Git, because there are so many resources on the internet that teaches you that already. But since I'm programming a complete project in this series and that's when version controlling actually becomes relevant and since I'm basically going to be using Git in every single video, I felt it necessary to at least say a few words about it. Okay, so first of all, why do we want to version control our software projects? Well, the need to version control actually arises as soon as you work on something digital. Whether you are writing an article or editing a video or writing code, you will want a way to track your changes so that you can go back to an earlier version in case you make a mistake or for some other reason decide that you want to use an earlier version. But for code, it becomes even more important because as a programmer, the changes that you produce are the actual building blocks that makes up the project that you are working on. And to work efficiently as a programmer, you need a good way to deal with those building blocks, especially if you're sharing them with other programmers. And that's what a version control system such as Git helps you with. More specifically, what Git lets you do is to package your changes into something called a commit. And a commit is basically just an ID that uniquely identifies the change that you made, as well as a message where you can describe what your change does. And it stores and keeps tracks of these versions in an efficient manner by only storing the differences instead of making a copy for each version. And Git also protects the validity and integrity of your commits so that you don't accidentally overwrite or modify your commits. And by tracking your changes as commits, you build up a history of commits that you can traverse in order to restore to an earlier version. And that also serves as a documentation over the progress of your project. Of course, the quality of this documentation is going to depend on how well you write your commit messages, which I will talk about in a moment. Also, as a side benefit of the distributed nature of Git, it also kind of helps you to make sure you back up your project because as soon as you work on your project from multiple computers or push your project to a hosting platform, you essentially back up the entire history of your project. And these reasons that I mentioned so far are all good reasons for using Git, but where Git truly shines is when you start collaborating with other developers, because then you run into a whole new set of problems that you have to deal with. And Git provides features to make it easier to work on different parts of the code at the same time, as well as making code reviews easier and to resolve conflicts when you merge your changes together. And given that collaboration is arguably the most important reason for using Git, it's a bit unfortunate that I'm a sole developer working on the project because it means that I will not be able to show you the full benefits of using Git in this video series. For this project, I'm mainly just going to be using Git for committing the changes that I make in each video to make the progress easier to follow. But even with this simple usage, I still think there is a lot to be gained from dividing your work into separate commits because it makes for a more organized workflow and dividing your project into well-defined incremental chunks also helps you foster that good agile mindset that has been adopted by so many companies and projects today. It also makes progress more visible and it's always more fun and motivating when you can see the progress that you make. Basically, I'm going to create a single repository that I'm going to store on GitHub for this project. And I'm going to divide the development of this project into several modules or the modules I described in the software architecture video. So each video is going to cover one module or one feature. So for example, one video for UART, one video for I squared C and one video for GPIO and so on. And since these features are kind of large, I'm probably going to end up making several commits per video because I prefer to do many small commits over few and big ones. Smaller commits just makes for a better workflow and it better aligns with the agile mindset that I mentioned before. Further on, I'm going to run Git as is from the command line on my Linux machine. There are some applications these days that provide graphical user interface for Git and Git also integrates pretty nicely with many editors and IDs, but I find that just using git as is from the command line works for most use cases and especially for the simple use cases that I'm going to use it for in this video series. Git is a very elegant and well designed tool which is something that you appreciate when you use it from the command line. I do however have a few plugins for my editor Vim just to make it play a bit more nicely with git. 
And to make sure I end up with a good history of commits, there are certain rules I'm going to follow for each commit. First of all, each commit should only contain one change. And this goes kind of hand in hand with what I said before, that I should commit small and often. By this I don't mean a single line of code, but each commit should only be about a single change or feature or bug. As a good rule of thumb, it should be easy to summarize the change into one short sentence. It's just a lot easier to deal with well-defined changes, as well as review smaller commits. Secondly, each commit should build and possibly pass any static analysis. And what I mean by this is that after I made a commit, I should be able to run make without getting any compiler errors. And I'm actually going to enforce this by setting up a small CI system using GitHub Actions. But I haven't actually set this up yet, so I will talk more about continuous integration and all of that in my next video when I've set everything up. Thirdly, I should write good commit messages. Each commit should shortly explain what the commit does, but more importantly, it should explain why it does it and why this change is needed. This third rule I think is especially important and I therefore want to spend some extra time elaborating on it in this video. Because while Git is a tool for tracking your changes, it's also in a sense a communication tool that you use to communicate your changes with other developers, including your future self. And the quality of that communication comes down to the quality of your commit messages. And while it may seem like a tedious effort to write a good commit message, there is nothing worse than coming into a code base and being met with a vague history of commits, where each commit doesn't actually explain what the commit does. So while it may take some effort, it quickly pays dividends when you come back and try to understand why you did something a certain way. And I think the best way to ensure that you write good commit messages is to come up with a convention and then to stick to that convention. And one such convention that I will be using throughout this project is a convention called conventional commit. And following this convention, my commit message will look as follow. At the top is the subject line and this line shouldn't be longer than 50 characters and it's divided into three parts. The first part is the type and this describes what type of change it is. So whether it's a feature or a bug or relates to the build system and so on. And the second part is uh, the scope and the scope describes what module of the code base that changed. So for this project I might uh, write I squared C, state machine, UART and so on. And the third part is the description and this should be a short sentence describing what the commit does. And this description should describe the solution and the fix and not the problem or the bug. And after the subject line comes a blank line followed by the body. And the body is where you write a more detailed description of your commit. And you should think of this body as a way to to motivate to a potential reviewer, even if it's just yourself, why this change is actually needed. While you should describe shortly what the commit does, you should mostly focus on why this change is needed and why you have to make this commit. After the body comes a blank line followed by an optional footer. And the footer is mainly for including any relevant metadata. And this could, for example, be if you are using an issue tracker such as Jira, you may have an issue number for the work you've done in this commit. And then it may be a good idea to add the issue number to the commit so you can easily link it up with the issue in your issue tracker. For this project or for this video series, I think I'm actually just going to include the video name in the footer so that it's easy to see what video the commit relates to. Finally, you should write in the imperative form. So if the verb in my commit message is change, I should write change and not changed or changing. You may feel the inclination to write in the past tense, but you should think of your commits as something that is to be applied and something that is to be committed. It's not a big deal, but it's actually shorter to write in the imperative form. And I think it's just a good idea to stick to one way of writing. So following these rules, let's now make the first commit of this project, which is going to be of the project structure that I showed you in the last video. So this structure right here. Before I initialize here, I can just quickly mention the git ignore file again. This file contains the files or directories that I don't want git to pick up. So for this project so far, I've just added the build directory because the build directory is going to contain the files that get generated during the build or when I run make. And since the files in the build directory is going to get generated and modified each time I build the project, it just doesn't make sense to include them as part of git. And to make sure I follow the rule that I set up before that each commit should build, let's just run make now to make sure that the project actually builds. And it does. And now I can run git init to initialize the repository. And then I'm going to configure the username as well as the user email. And as you can see, I used a local flag here and that's just because I prefer to have a specific configuration per repository instead of relying on a global Git configuration. And now I can add all of the files for the first commit. So I'm just going to use the dot sign here because that's going to pick up all of the files in the current directory. And now I can run status to see that it has picked that up. And as you can see, it has now added all of the files in the directory. Of course, right now it's just mostly placeholder files. So let's now commit these files. And following the rules laid out by conventional commits, we should first start with the subject line, uh, starting with the type. 
And since this is not really a feature or a fix, I think the most appropriate type for this uh, kind of commit is build. And since it doesn't relate to any specific scope, I'm just going to leave the scope out. And then I will just add a short description to describe what the commit does. So this commit sets the project structure and add initial files and then leave a blank line between the subject line and the body. Fill the project directory with all the required directories to immediately clarify the project structure to be used uh, throughout the project series. And I can also mention here that I add some placeholder files because otherwise git won't pick up the directories. And then for the footer, as I said, I'm just going to include the video name here and that's going to be how I version control with git best practices. And then I can save this. And now I have committed the first commit for this project and I can run git log to see that it's actually there. I have already set up a repository on GitHub. So now I'm just going to add a GitHub remote so that I can push my project to that repository. And I've also already set up my SSH key and so on. So this will just work without me entering any password. And as you can see, now the project is available on GitHub. And here nicely showing the images from my readme. So let's now also... So let's now do a second commit where I add the external project that I will be relying on in this uh, project, which is the stripped down printf implementation. And since this project is available as a Git repository on GitHub, I like to include projects like this as is as a Git submodule so that I know where it came from and which particular commit I'm using of it. And I'm going to add this project under external. So let's start by removing the placeholder file I have here. And then to add a Git submodule, you write Git submodule add, and then I'm just going to write the address for the GitHub repository I want to add as a submodule and then the path to where I want to put it. So that's going to be under external and printf. So now it actually cloned that repository to under external printf. And it has also added a file under my repository dot dot git modules. So I, we can read into that as well. And we can also check status. And let's just make sure that I also add the deleted placeholder file so like that. And now I can commit again. And following the same conventions again, uh, starting with the type. For this, I um, would say it's a feature and the scope is maybe external. And what the commit does is it adds a strip down printf implementation. And here in the body, I should explain why I'm adding this external project. So that's because the printf implementation part of the standard library is too large for a small microcontroller. So use an external down implementation and add it unchanged as a git submodule for better tracking. And then for the footer I'm going to add the video name again and save it. Now I can push it again and check the log. So now I have two commits in the log as expected. So these were the two commits that I wanted to make in this video. Overall, I will put some extra effort into using Git in this project series, more than you would typically do for a personal side project because when it's only you working on a project, it's quite easy to get lazy with Git. But for this project series, I actually want to set a good example because Git is such an integral part of software development these days. So I think it's important to have some good practices in place when you are using it. Only two commit messages so far, but you will have the chance to see how I use Git and write commit messages many times throughout this video series. And hopefully I end up with a history of commits that clearly aligns with the rest of the video series. That was all for now. See you next time.